Lawmakers return to Springfield for the fall veto session. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Good evening, and thank you for tuning in to Capitol View, the show where we talk about Illinois politics and government. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn, with Illinois Issues Magazine. And with me today is longtime State House watcher and observer Mike Lawrence. Uh, good to be here. Glad you're here, Mike. Uh, Patrick Diego with Illinois Times. Pat, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And Jim Leach, Program and News Director with WMAY Radio. Jim, thanks for coming. Thank you, Jamie. So we have our special veto session edition of Capitol View. The lawmakers return to Springfield and walk through those new shiny copper doors to have their veto session this week. Um, not a lot actually happened this week as far as legislation getting passed, but there are a lot of issues swirling around and people are watching to see what's going to happen before veto session ends in the first week of November. Pat, can you tell us a little bit about kind of what's on the docket? Um, well, probably the, the main issue that took the, uh, the headlines this week was the same-sex marriage debate. Um, there was a, a reasonably large rally um, downtown right in front of this Capitol building of um, same-sex marriage proponents um, calling for Senate Bill 10, which is the, the bill that would lift the ban on same-sex marriage um, to be passed. And um, the following day, of course, um, a, a group opposed to same-sex marriage came and rallied at the same spot. And so um, that was probably the biggest um, issue to, to, you know, take the veto session this week. Um, but as well, you know, there's pension reform that is still simmering on the back burner. And I um, don't know if we're going to hear anything about that for a while, but we'll see. Um, and of course, the ADM tax break, uh, ADM out of Decatur um, seeking to move to Chicago and um, asking for a tax break to do so, or they threaten to possibly, I'm not sure if threat is the right word, but they've said they may end up leaving the state if that doesn't happen. So um, that, those are the main ones. Um, there's also a gun proposal um, to increase mandatory um, minimum sentences for gun crimes. So a lot of stuff out there. Let's kind of break it down one issue at a time. Same-sex marriage. Um, Jim, there was a little bit of a local angle with this, with folks kind of, you know, going around Springfield, wanting to go to the Catholic Church. The, the Catholic Church is not too thrilled about that. Can you tell us a little bit about how, kind of what was going on with this protest? Sure. Uh, our bishop, a uh, very vocal opponent of same-sex marriage, has even referred to it as an intrinsic evil. So he hasn't held back at all in his uh, strong terminology on this. And some of the people that were there rallying had indicated plans to actually go to the cathedral for a late afternoon mass on the day of the rally, wearing rainbow sashes, and then to actually enter and to pray loudly that same-sex marriage could become the law of the land here in Illinois. And the bishop uh, sent out a warning ahead of time saying that anyone wearing that sash would not be allowed in. Anybody who attempted to in any way disrupt uh, the mass or to advocate for something that he views as blasphemous would be actually asked to leave the cathedral. It wound up being fairly anticlimactic. Only a handful of people actually showed up at the cathedral uh, to make that demonstration, but it, uh, it certainly got a lot of attention, which is what this is really all about. Uh, it, you're not going to necessarily move any votes for a rally like this or a demonstration like that. You're just looking for attention and trying to, I guess, show the public uh, that you have the numbers on your side. There was a big social media debate as to actually had the larger crowd at the rally. Was it the pro same-sex marriage event on Tuesday or the anti-event on Wednesday? Uh, the official count, I think, actually gave a slight edge to the pro same-sex marriage group, but the folks that were opposed to it say that the, those numbers were deliberately downplayed and they insist they had the, the bigger crowd on Wednesday. Well, and it was really hard to tell. Folks were spread out all over the Capitol mm -hmm. complex lobbying, but they definitely a strong turnout for both sides. Mike, as Jim said, this isn't really going to maybe move votes. Uh, what probably will, will be political considerations looking heading into the primary season. What do you think lawmakers are, are thinking about this week looking at this issue? Well, I think they're thinking about their political futures <laughs> and the uh, impact of this vote on their futures. Uh, it's interesting, uh, since uh, we've gotten into redistricting uh, the way we do, it's become such a fine art, and we have created uh, districts uh, that with few exceptions are either heavily Democratic or heavily Republican. Uh, lawmakers tend to be more concerned about primary elections than they do general elections. So uh, I think the main concern uh, in, in both parties possibly uh, because of the opposition to same-sex marriage, uh, 
among some of the African American uh, ministers is uh, whether uh, the, a person who supports same-sex marriage or, or maybe somebody who opposes it is going to get a primary contest. And uh, filing uh, for uh, the primaries uh, is a little bit away, and I think that probably a lot of these legislators uh, will um, uh, get a little more uh, emboldened to vote one way or the other once they the filing season has passed and they see whether they'll have a primary or not. What was really intriguing, though, was at the anti event on Wednesday, Kirk Dillard was there, a uh, Republican candidate for governor, state senator, and a guy who's really cultivated this reputation as a Jim Edgar Republican, a, a moderate, uh, kind of down the middle guy, not, not real extreme. Uh, but he was there uh, in the midst of people who had some pretty harsh rhetoric on the issue, and the only one of the four Republican contenders who actually came to that event. Uh, I thought it was pretty intriguing to stake out this territory that I think a lot of people had seen was really Bill Brady's turf up mm -hmm. until this point uh, to align themselves with those sorts of social conservatives. Uh, Kirk Dillard's working hard to get those four it raises a question about will it be enough to help him in the primary and will it damage him in the general election if he is victorious? Well, I, I was surprised uh, to uh, see him there and, and disappointed. Uh, he has had this reputation of being a, a moderate and uh, I thought just being there and speaking, uh, even if he did not say uh, what he said or uh, even if he didn't say it in the way he said it, just the fact he was there at that rally uh, would uh, perhaps change uh, his perception or the percep perception that people have of him, as Jim said, uh, of being a moderate, because that was not a moderate crowd uh, by any sense. And uh, he took a speaking role. There were there are two other gubernatorial candidates in that four-way primary. They weren't there. It was Dillard and Brady. And uh, like I say, I was, I was uh, disappointed, really, that uh, Senator Dillard was there. How do you think, Mike, Republican candidates handle this issue? Like, Bruce Rauner has basically refused to take position. He says that there should be a, a referendum, which this can't be done through referendum, but there could be a referendum to see what voters think of it and then a law passed. Do you think that's the best way for Republicans? It's difficult during the primary looking to appeal to the base, but then during the general election, as you said, people may view you not as a moderate any longer. Um, how do Republicans strike that balance? Well, uh, <coughs> it is a, a delicate balance. Uh, this may sound uh, overly simple, but I think they ought to go with what their core belief is, and if it costs them votes one way or another, or helps them get votes, that's, that's what it ought to be. Now, uh, part of this is uh, the idea of uh, uh, taking a position without necessarily uh, um, stating your views in a way that uh, could be construed as pandering or, on the other side of it, uh, appearing to be intolerant. In other words, uh, and I think we've seen this in the abortion uh, debates through the years, you've had candidates who've been either pro-life or pro-choice, but the way they address the issue uh, will indicate tolerance uh, for the other viewpoint. And as I say, I think that uh, a candidate should uh, go with a core belief on it and then uh, address it in a way that shows some tolerance. I'd rather, much rather see that than the pandering to a particular group or, uh, or, uh, or, or another group uh, by, uh, you know, raising the uh, rhetoric and uh, so it's, uh, it is delicate, but uh, again, I think one of the keys is to indicate some tolerance. Now, it's going to cost you some votes from intolerant people, but <laughs> I think most Illinoisans would be in the tolerant category. Uh, regardless of where they hold a view one way or another, they do want 
most Illinoisans, I think, want to believe that somebody is at least uh, open to and respects views that are different uh, than uh, the views that, that the candidate holds. And I, I'm not sure that Dillard had a whole lot to lose, though, by going, because chances are he probably wasn't going to take a, a large share of the Democratic vote one way or the other, um, just because I think of the, um, the very, I think, divided, you know, partisan environment that we're in. So by going a little bit to the right on this issue, um, he may have, you know, like you were talking about, um, taken a share of Bill Brady's votes, you know, that um, possibly could have um, hurt him uh, in the primary. So I think you were, you're bringing up a good point about the, the primaries and what that kind of does to candidates, especially on the right, because if there's a, a, a candidate that's farther right, uh, further right of you, then you may have to shift a little bit in order to, um, uh, I guess, satisfy a larger base of your own party in the primary, even if that's not how you feel going into the general. So. Well, that's, you know, we, we uh, could have a pretty good discussion <laughs> here on, on strategy, but the fact of the matter is, I think there was a potential uh, because of uh, Senator Dillard's image mm -hmm. as a moderate of some Democrats and independents coming into the Republican primary to support him, uh, because Pat Quinn is not all that <laughs> popular uh, among Democrats. Mm -hmm. And there is no gubernatorial primary of any significance uh, involving him. And so I, I, I think there was a, uh, and, and there still may be, we'll see, one rally doesn't necessarily do it, but <laughs> I think what we've seen is that uh, Senator Dillard has moved to the right on social issues, and uh, to the extent, in fact, I've, I've talked to Democrats and independents who have told me, I'm, you know, I'm really inclined to, to vote for Dillard, mm -hmm. but boy, he seems to be moving to the right. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems like um, Democrats who perceive him as moderate might think that, um, you know, if a same-sex mar marriage bill hit his desk, maybe he could be convinced, but when he attends something like this, they may not think that anymore. So, Jim, you look like you wanted to jump no, in. No, I, I, I agree with the analysis here. It's a kind of an interesting strategy because, you know, certainly in Republican primaries, that, that uh, farther right wing of the party tends to be the determining factor, but they've also tended to be pretty skeptical of somebody they view as being sort of late to the game. <laughs> mm -hmm. Bill Brady's been their guy all along, and so I wonder if when it really comes down to crunch time, if those folks will really think that Kirk Dillard is sincere, or if in fact he might be someone who might be drawn back to the center in a general election, or if he's actually in the governor's office, uh, is if this is really more just political posturing than it is uh, a, a real sincere belief on his part. Because again, it's not something he's really uh, advocated all that strongly in the past, at least that I'm aware of. So uh, it, it's one of those strategies where I think he sees uh, that's the turf that he can stake out for himself, maybe to victory in the primary, if those voters think he's genuine about it. But I really do think it damages him in the, uh, in the general election. I know a lot, there are a lot of Democrats who Kirk Dillard would have been their choice four years ago <laughs> if he had managed to, to beat Bill Brady. They would have easily voted for Dillard over Pat Quinn in the general election. I don't think they feel the same way now based on some of what they're hearing coming from Kirk Dillard in this primary campaign. You know, it's a, a two-step dance, the <laughs> primary and the general. Yeah. And there are some candidates who forget there's a primary and they look ahead to the general and forget there's a primary. Then you have others who forget there's a general. Now, Bill Brady was the nominee the last time, uh, very conservative on social issues. And uh, a lot of people, including me, believe that's why he's lost. Uh, Pat Quinn was very vulnerable, but Bill Brady did not get the votes of people who may be fiscally conservative, and I'm thinking particularly of women in the Collar counties, but are looking for tolerance out of candidates. Uh, they, a candidate may be pro-life, and that's not necessarily going to cost him the votes of the women I'm talking about and, and some men as well. But if there, is, if there are a string of positions taken by a candidate that indicate a rigidity or narrowness, it's going to hurt. The Republicans should have won the governorship four years ago. They didn't. And I believe a lot of that was the fact they nominated a candidate who was viewed as 
too intolerant, too conservative. Well, we're going down a little political side road yeah. here, but that's always kind of fun. <laughs> Just one other thing, um, you know, looking at, at Dillard making these choices, it seems as though he's running against Bill Brady instead of perhaps Bruce Rauner. What does that mean? And, and, and if uh, folks are kind of fighting over the conservative title, does that leave Rauner to draw some of the more moderate people? Well, he's, he's been going after Rauner on a couple of areas, uh, his connections to Rahm Emanuel, for example. So Dillard hasn't you know, really uh, let up on that. I think Dillard's looking at, at the money game here. His fundraising has been dismal up until this point. Rauner has almost unlimited money. Uh, I think Dillard feels like if he's going to pull this out, he's going to need uh, a lot of bodies, just a lot of foot soldiers, uh, a, a fervent base of support, which is why, again, I think that's why he's now really trying to appeal uh, to those groups of folks who can really mobilize in large numbers. He's not going to outspend Rauner. He's going to have to find another strategy to be able to get past him in the primary. Well, Pat kind of gave us the rundown at the beginning of the show of, of what the issues are. We've spent a lot of time on same-sex marriage, so we'll move on. Um, the ADM tax breaks. ADM has been a um, base indicator for, I believe, over 40 years, and they are planning to move their corporate headquarters, which will only be about 100 jobs, but of course folks don't want to see it leave Illinois. So there is talk of giving them tax breaks to relocate in Chicago. Jim, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on here? Sure. Well, they're leaving, and it's, it is only 100 jobs out of you know, several thousand that they have indicator, but it's 100 of the best highest paying jobs and there are or at least some people who think this might be just a, a first step if they pull out uh, this group out of Decatur that maybe more could follow so it's got people very uneasy in an area of the state that has the highest unemployment rate in the state right now uh, and uh, it comes down to a philosophical question do you essentially pay somebody to pull jobs out of an area of the state that really needs those jobs move them to someplace else in the state uh, but if you don't pay them, do you run the risk that they're going to take those jobs and, and leave the state entirely? Uh, Governor Pat Quinn has said he doesn't see any need to give them tax breaks until we resolve pension reform. He's using that, again, as leverage to get what he really wants, which is a pension reform deal. Uh, and it doesn't, I, I know that there, there is legislation there, but certainly in this area, I hear a lot of folks who uh, almost feel like they're saying good riddance. You know, mm -hmm. we, we just, we don't want to play these games anymore. Uh, of having to pony up every time some company says, if you don't help us out, we're going to take our jobs and leave. Uh, office, which uh, one of the office supply, <laughs> Max mm -hmm. or it, Office Max. Office or, Max and Office Depot merged, are merging, right, right. and they're sort of pitting Illinois against Florida of, of where their new headquarters will be. So mm -hmm. they're looking for a similar tax break. Sure. You know, and we've seen this in some cases where it hasn't come out to anything. Jimmy John's, for example, had talked about moving their headquarters out, ultimately didn't happen. Then again, Sears, it was the same story, and they got some pretty lucrative tax breaks just to move a, a few miles up the road. Uh, and at some point, people are saying, when do we stop this? When, when do we stop I, I don't, some views the word extortion, that might be a little bit strong, but it feels that way sometimes. It's sort of saying, give us this or we're leaving. In ADM's case, it's not a massive tax break, it's not a huge amount of money, but there's something philosophical about it that people are starting to say, at what point do we stop letting our, ourselves be dictated to in this way? But then on the flip side of that, a lot of folks are arguing that Illinois is not the most business friendly state right now. Um, and this is a way that the state can make it up to businesses who are bringing jobs here. Mike, is that fair to, to, to kind of say, well, Illinois is not very business friendly, so they need to give us tax breaks? Well, I, uh, I think uh, if you talk to CEOs and over the years and even recently, uh, they make their decisions based on where they locate, where they expand on factors like the workforce, uh, the quality of life, where their suppliers are. Now, if they can get some tax breaks while they're at it, they'll take them. But those are not the driving decisions. Uh, however, if uh, it won't be good for the morale of the state if, if ADM locates somewhere, its headquarters, somewhere other than Chicago. It, it's just going to be another negative thing. Uh, I'm not sure where this is all going to end up. Uh, I, uh, there, there are, uh, there is rather, a, a, uh, a state law that allows for these kind of credits, and other people have gotten the credits that ADM is seeking. But uh, it seems to me we've got to draw the line somewhere. I mean, you're going to have one company after another, and what we really need to work on is 
the business climate of the state, which can involve a lot of different factors. In the end, uh, and I could be dead wrong, I think they're going to, uh, I think in the end ADM will get the incentive unless ADM for some reason withdraws its request because it's easier for a governor and a legislature to say yes than no. And <laughs> that's part of the reason the state's in the uh, situation it's in. Uh, so uh, w we'll see. I, uh, I don't think uh, as a matter of policy that we ought to getting a, uh, keep getting into these incentive uh, deals and bidding games. We ought to work on the basic uh, uh, economic structure and uh, the, the uh, basic business job creation environment in the state. But of course the issue that's hanging over everything uh, during these two weeks of veto session is pension reform. Pat, can you kind of catch us up to what's going on or what's happened up to this point? There's a special committee, they're working on things. Uh, that's <laughs> about the extent of it, honestly. <laughs> the, um, the, the conference committee between the House and Senate is trying to find a solution that, um, that first of all, of course, works, that actually you know does save the state money and doesn't um, you know, get us in the same situation as the, the pension ramp previously. But also, um, they are trying to find a solution that won't wind them up in front of the Supreme Court. Um, and it seems that, I guess, the, the period with which they're, they've taken, you know, the time that length, a length of time that they've taken to deliberate on this, it seems to me that they've been at least um, diligent in letting the, the unions have their say, you know, have their, have their um, place at the table, and I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that they're going to come through with some proposal that the unions can live with and don't have to, um, you know, fight in court um, because um, chances are the Supreme Court will um, kick it back. You know, if there if there's any um, if there's any question about the constitutionality, and um, as I think yeah, you were saying before. While, yeah, I mean. and as you were saying before, um, there's always that issue of you know the police powers. You know, it's almost a uh, um, one of the arguments that lawmakers are making, uh, perhaps in the final bill, is that this no so desperately needs to be done that right. that they can kind of go beyond the constitutional clause and and take care of it. There is a protection in the in the constitution. Mike, um, Senate President John Cullerton made some comments that folks are getting kind of upset about that, that might play into that, saying that this isn't an immediate crisis. Can you explain a little bit what's going on there, why someone might say that? I mean, all we hear, it seems, is crisis of pensions, crisis of pensions, and now one of the leaders, uh, one of the Democratic leaders is saying, well, maybe it's not a crisis yet. Well, I, I, I have to say, I, I don't understand why Senator Colinton said what he did, uh, I, but it strikes me that we do have a crisis. Now, the argument is, well, uh, we can do something about the ramp or that, 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 that the steep increases in the payment ramp over the next several years uh, will cease and it'll flatten out. And I've heard arguments that if we just take a deep breath and even extend the period where we would get to 100% funding or 80% funding, that that would uh, certainly uh, alleviate uh, the need to do something substantial. But I, I don't think the bonding houses see it that way, and I don't think the state's business community sees it that way. One of the problems we have in Illinois, uh, as far as businesses locating or expanding here, is the fiscal uncertainty. I mean, they are reluctant to make decisions when they don't know uh, what the costs are going to be, particularly with respect to taxes uh, down the line. So uh, I think it's important. I think uh, most uh, people who pay attention to this think it's very important that the legislature and the governor come up with a plan. Uh, I. Uh, uh, you know, I, it's not easy to do, uh, in part for the reason that uh, Pat alluded to, the possibility of a court suit, and frankly, I think you're going to get a court suit, even if the unions are on board. 
I mean, there will be retirees who don't agree with what their union leadership <laughs> does. But uh, one of the, uh, it's hard enough to get a legislator to cast a vote that could very likely make some constituents very, very unhappy when at least it's going to solve or uh, address a problem in a very positive way. In this case, you're asking legislators, we want you to cast a tough, tough vote, and ultimately the Supreme Court may throw out what you voted for. Uh, so it's not going to solve the problem in the <laughs> long run, and in the meantime, you're, you're going to take a lot of political heat. That is a tough persuasion job, really. But he's also got the problem on the other side in that you've got at least half this conference committee uh, that doesn't feel like the current plan on the table goes far enough. I, I took President Cullerton's remarks is sort of trying, trying to say, uh, don't feel like you can't vote for this because you don't think it goes far enough because little fixes mean a lot when you stretch it down to 30 years down the road. You can do make some adjustments now and it will have a bigger impact each year that we go through it. Uh, and I, I looked at it as he was trying to maybe give some cover to people who would say, I can't vote for this because it doesn't go far enough. Mike's absolutely correct. It's a crisis because uh, the longer we wait to pass something, the longer we wait to start the inevitable court fight and that's going to drag it out even farther. No fix is going to take effect probably for a year or two before all the litigation is done, which is why it'd be really good to get something passed now test the water, see what the courts will actually allow, uh, because until you know that, uh, all of this is academic, until you know what's going to actually pass constitutional muster. Well, lawmakers are out next week, and then they come back in the first week of November for three days of veto session. We'll see if they can get all this stuff wrapped up in three days, um, and we'll be back to cover all that. I'd like to thank my guests for this week, Mike, Pat, and Jim. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time on Capital View.